Fine. Hey everybody, Luke McElroy from Mess Performance Society. Welcome back to another episode of the Physiology Secrets Podcast. Joined today by Nick Jane Koskis. Uh, we had a question come through from Paul, uh, who came in in January. Actually, target was to do a 3.30 marathon, and he achieved that recently, which was good. Must have got in just before yeah. all the COVID restrictions. And he just had a question about how Garmin predicts VO2 max. So I think when he came in, it was very accurate. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, he hasn't come back in for testing just yet. He's going to come in soon. But... Um, it, it went up from like 50, I can't remember that, 51 to 58 or something like yeah. that. Uh, and it's a fairly common question. I know you've got some content yourself uh, talking about how it predicts it. So you just want to give us a bit of an overview of, of, of what I'm talking about and, and how, how from your research, yep. um, how it predicts VO2 max. Yeah, so very simple. I'll link the video that we've already done um, in the description. But very simply, what we're looking at is the, the VO2 indicator that might come up. Usually it comes up at the end of each run or the end of each bike session. In the, if you look at like the achievement section, or if it, if it is a new VO2 max, Garmin will just show it up anyway. Um, but it's essentially estimating your oxygen consumption based on a number of factors. So it's plotting what your heart rate's like versus what your pace or your power is like, putting it all on a graph, um, collecting all of your data from all of your different types of sessions as well. So all your low end sessions, your mid type stuff, your threshold type stuff, and your top VO2 work. Um, plots it all out and essentially oxygen consumption and heart rate work in a linear progression. So it's something that anyone who's come in before, if you've got your set of VO2 max data, you can flick across to the tab that says VO2 versus heart rate. You actually see that linear progression that as exercise intensity increases in the test or as you increase the intensity if you go out and do your sessions, VO2 is going up, so your oxygen consumption is going up, but heart rate's going up in like a proportional way. So as one goes up, the other does as well. Um, Paces and wattage is obviously linked in that as well because that's your intensity factor. So intensity is going up, heart rate's going up, VO2 is going up. That's how roughly they're getting that prediction because then they're taking all the information going, what do we know about the average 30 to 35 year old male who's reasonably fit or the one who takes marathon running a bit more seriously or triathlon a bit more seriously. Puts all that, that um, together plus with things like body weight. So a big one that always skews the, the data in, um, in Garmin can be athletes not updating their body weight in Garmin Connect. Um, obviously, it's a relative measure, so it's per kilogram of mass. So that one can be a bit of a factor that, that does bring the result um, up or down accordingly. But predominantly, it's just going to then fluctuate based on the types of sessions you do as well. So if you always go out and just do long slow, it'll probably underestimate your VO2 yeah. max because yep. the pace isn't there. It doesn't have that information on what your high end stuff is. Same, same on the other end, it'll potentially overestimate your VO2 max if all you do is just the high intensity stuff. Or even then, sometimes it can go the other way for the high intensity is like, well, we haven't really seen any of this like capacity work. So maybe you're not as aerobically fit as what we think because all you do is like short sharp all the time. And there's potentially, if your watch isn't picking up, like I know if I go and do 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off running, GPS isn't fast enough to pick up that I'm running at 320 pace. It thinks I'm running at five minute K pace because of the recovery period. So that's how it can sometimes skew it a bit. Yeah. But as long as you've got a mix of intensities, you've got good quality GPS data coming in, good quality heart rate data, and things like body weight and stuff are, are correct and your age and that is correct in Garmin Connect, it does a reasonable job from what we see. Yeah, and that's yeah. So I think I think the key is I think you need to have um, I'm not sure the exact number, but like 20 minutes of steady state yeah, stuff. Like you have, time you have to have some, yeah, like I said, those mix of intensities are probably going to give you that as well like some long slow some middle ground yeah. as well but the top end and as you said if you don't just if you just do long slow long that's going to well and truly under yeah. predict it so it needs that, that range it needs to be continuous training you need to have heart rate obviously yeah um because it's going to match up your heart rate with either your power or your pace mm -hmm. um to then predict that vo2 max and uh, th theoretically it should be reasonably accurate but what it doesn't take into account is particularly for running is your economy yeah it doesn't time. oh does it no i don't think it does no, I mean, not, it not eventually because of all the, the, yeah. the os vertical oscillation stuff, but I don't think it does at the moment. Not overly, and it's going to be the type of thing, it's always going to be estimating based on, I guess, a, a bit of a prediction factor of, like, like I said, what they know from typical athlete as well. Like, we know that you might have a, a relatively low VO2 or oxygen consumption, but you might have an incredible economy. So yeah. you might be lower on the norm, but in terms of your VO2 max, your watch might not tell you as high, but you're actually quite a solid athlete still. So... That's where it can be a little bit tricky to then determine was it actually telling me the right thing or not. Plus, on the upside, you can have really high oxygen consumption and horrible economy, and it goes the other way. Yeah, yeah. And we were just just as a quick refresher, when we talk about economy, we're just talking about how much oxygen it takes to run at a certain speed. So, uh, basically, your running technique. You know, if yeah. you're, if you're it's going to be a big part of it. Yeah. If you've got a foot plant well and truly forward of your center of mass, and that's going to be a braking force, and you're going to yeah. be really 
uneconomical. Is that the word? Yep. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be more economical when you have the foot plant straight into the body, pushing straight back. So uh, it's how effectively you're using um, the oxygen, basically. Yeah. And um, the other thing, I guess, it, it, with VO2 is that VO2 is is a reasonably good indicator for sort of three minute events, that sort of stuff. Yeah, but when sure you go is. close to that 20 minute stuff, which is kind of what you need to get a, a VO2 estimate on the watch, yeah. um, that's when things like lactate threshold is going to be a limiting factor of anything because yeah. you can't, well, where's your lactate threshold? 70%, which is about normal, or is it up at 95% like the, like you know elite 1500 meter runners are? Yeah. That's gonna have a, a dramatic effect because it's not like you can hold VO2 max for 20 minutes. If you need to do a yeah. 20 minute steady state, whatever time trial, you're not holding yeah. VO2 max for that. You're holding your threshold, which, whether that's 70 yeah. or 95%, VO2 max, we don't really know. So that's why for, for a lot of, I'm not saying the average, for the more typical endurance athlete, you know, threshold yeah. around 70, 80%, and that sort of stuff, you go do your 20 minute time trial. It's going to be reasonably accurate, but then it comes just like with max heart rate, 220 minus your age works at 68%, yeah. and the other 32 is rubbish. Uh, it's going to be the same with this, where it's going to be pretty accurate for a lot of people, but then mm. if your economy isn't typical um, or your threshold isn't typical based on yeah. everybody, the generic sort of equations, then it's going to so be a, a little bit out. So, um, yeah, that, that's what I was going to say. That's what I find in my stuff. I do heaps of really high intensity and not much in that sort of threshold at the moment anyway. It's the type of thing that like, yeah, I can go run. My VO2 max pace might be at like 320 pace, but it tells me on my watch my VO2 is no good because I just don't do any of that middle stuff. So it doesn't have enough data to plot it. Um, and like my threshold as a percentage is probably awful at the moment. But if you've got someone who's got a really good percentage, they go out and hammer themselves to 20 minutes. They can hold a really high yeah. power or pace. The VO2 max, uh, like compared to that, may not be much higher in terms of pacing, but it might tell them because of all the data they've collected. It's like, oh, gee, you held 180 beats per minute for 20 minutes at a really high wattage. Therefore, you've got a high VO2 max. I'm like, is it really? Yeah. Maybe, maybe not. That's where measuring it in here is going to be the only way you're going to get definite on what your oxygen consumption actually is. Because again, it's an estimation. It's like it's like yeah. anything. I remember when I used to. We used to be fit. <laughs> I used to, it used to estimate my VO2 at about 60, yep. and it was actually closer to 70, but then yep. the race predictor said I could do 5Ks in like 14 something, or six, yeah. maybe it was 16 something. No. Either way, not gonna happen. PB's yeah. like seven, high 17s, and that's when I was really so, fit. Yeah. Um, my marathon prediction, I think, at the moment, is like 245. There's yeah. no way I could run that. Yeah. Um, so, so, and that's the other yeah. thing, it's just isolating VO2, whereas, whereas the longer the event, the, the less predictive VO2 max mm. is. Because you can't hold it, you literally physically cannot hold VO2 max more than about you know maybe six seven minutes if you if you're lucky. Yep. Um, that's where your, your threshold comes in, and also then you've got um, you know heat stress, dehydration, nutrition, all, all yep. those other all, all those other factors as well. So VO2 max is one thing. I think Garmin get it, Garmin get it reasonably accurate, but then the race predictor on the shorter side maybe it's closer, but still a bit out. But then once you get to like marathon, yeah, distance, it always seems way out. Yeah, I, yeah. So, some people it might be okay for, but I, I find most. Most athletes I talk to, and even my own, it's a long way out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Anything else to add? Um, no, not really. Again, it's just a predictor or an estimate. Um, best way to actually find it is if you test it and directly measure the oxygen consumption. Um, best way to then identify what you, I guess, your racing is, is to go out and do a half marathon. Is the only way you're going to know exactly what you can do. But if you're using it as a as a guide, probably the last thing on the on the Garmin side of things is. Don't necessarily look at it day to day. Like it's yeah. the type of thing you want to be looking at it as trends over time with uh, with that type of metric. You look at it today versus tomorrow, and it might drop three mils per kilo. And like, no need to panic. That's just the difference in what type of session you did and gum, and then putting that back in. Um, look at it maybe at the end of each month, or maybe end of each two months, end of a training cycle, whatever you, however you want to do it. But a trend over time is going to give you a better picture of how it's changing. Um, if you are just using it off your watch rather than getting it tested and measured. Yeah, yeah. So, in, so in summary, for the to get your Garmin VO two, you need to have a, a way, an internal and an external measure. So, internal is your heart rate. You've got to have a heart rate monitor on. Yep. You need to be measuring power or pace. Uh, it's, Garmin is then going to correlate that over about you know a twenty minute steady state period. Uh, it's going to spit out a number which is based on on the average running economy and pedaling economy and, and assuming that your you know your threshold is about average. So it's going to be pretty accurate for again bell curve. About sixty eight percent of people will be yep. reasonably accurate, but for the guys that have slightly uh, more or less economical running style, higher or lower threshold, then it'll be a little bit out. Uh, but it is a good predictor. Track it over time, and if you obviously want to get a good measurement, you come in here. But uh, it's always interesting to see that that, that people often say it's very similar mm. here versus the watch as well, and obviously the other way around as well. Yeah, uh, we'll link that video that Nick did the other week uh, if you want to learn more about it, and we'll speak to you on the next episode.